I'm Nima Rajan. A workers' union says most miners who were trapped underground in northern Ontario have returned safely to the surface. The United Steel Workers' Union says no one was physically injured in the incident and the evacuation at Totten Mine near Sudbury, Ontario. Vale, the company that owns the mine, says it expects all miners to emerge through a ladder system. The company said the employees were trapped in the mine on Sunday. This was when a scoop bucket being sent underground detached and blocked the mine shaft. Turnout numbers are in for the 2021 federal election. 62% of eligible voters cast their ballots. That's about average, despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Elections Canada says almost 17 million Canadians voted out of 27.4 million eligible voters. That does not include voters who registered on Election Day, so the final number could still move up. A record number of Canadians, some 850,000, voted by mail. A new poll suggests Canadians are not as upset about the federal election result as they were about the election itself. Of more than 1,500 respondents in an online Liger survey, 10% said they were happy with the outcome. Another 24% said they're comfortable with the outcome. This while 9% said they would prefer a minority government in any event, and 14% were indifferent. Only 12% said they were angry about the outcome, 6% said they were uncomfortable with it, and 24% said they are unhappy about it, but life goes on. Canada's foreign minister says the two Michaels paid a heavy price for the federal government obeying the rule of law. In his speech to the UN General Assembly in New York on Monday, Mark Garneau affirmed the solidarity of Canada and its allies in defending international law and human rights. He thanked international partners for standing with Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor during their nearly three-year imprisonment in China. The B.C. government has announced $29 million in funding will be used to create new job opportunities for women and minorities in the technology sector. The program is based on the Innovator Skills Initiative, which provides companies thousands of dollars per employee for the first four months of employment. The Parliamentary Secretary for Tech and Innovation, Brenda Bailey, says the program will help people who have experienced barriers to jobs and will create 3,000 new positions. Alberta saw an average of more than 1,700 new COVID-19 cases each day from Friday through to Sunday. The province now has more than 21,000 active cases and there were 23 more deaths over the weekend. There are now 265 people in intensive care with the illness. Alberta has more than doubled its intensive care capacity to handle the surge in cases. But doctors warn that the system is close to being overwhelmed. Meanwhile, an Alberta liver transplant specialist says Saskatchewan's organ donation suspension will have ripple effects across Canada. Dr. Kelly Burak, a doctor and professor of medicine at the University of Calgary, says organs from Saskatchewan are used to save lives nationwide. In fact, he says 16% of all liver donations in Alberta over the last five years came from Saskatchewan. The pause was due to a need to redirect staff to deal with a surge in COVID-19 cases. Ontario is investing $100 million in the province's tourism sector to help it recover from the pandemic. Tourism Minister Lisa McLeod says the money will be distributed through the new Tourism Recovery Program. Eligible tourism businesses include inns and lodges, boat tours, ski centres, live performance venues, cinemas, drive-in theatres and amusement and water parks. The Quebec government says it will offer up to four hours of free legal advice for victims of sexual assault or domestic violence. Justice Minister Simon Jolin Barré announced the program yesterday in Montreal. He says the government will give victims access to lawyers working in areas such as criminal, civil, family and immigration law. He says victims won't have to file a complaint to access the service. The government had been offering similar services to victims as part of a pilot project in 2020, overseen by non-profit legal clinic Pop. The Council of Atlantic Premiers will meet virtually today. New Brunswick Premier Blaine Higgs had planned to host his three counterparts in person in Moncton yesterday and today. But a regional spike in COVID-19 cases has forced the council to change its plans and take its meeting virtual. Halifax Mayor Mike Savage says a massive weekend gathering near Dalhousie University was nothing short of unacceptable behavior during a pandemic, and it won't be tolerated. Police responded to a flood of noise complaints on Saturday and found thousands of people partying. They arrested nine men and one woman for public intoxication. 
All right, we'll be right back after the break with one expert's considerations for Canada's next defence minister. We speak with Charlotte Duval-Antoine of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute up next. After that interview, of course, more news from around the world on Forum Daily. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after a short break. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is hearing from several experts on sexual misconduct in the military to consider a woman as defence minister as he builds a new cabinet. The calls are based on a belief that Harjit Sajjan has lost credibility when it comes to addressing what senior commanders themselves have described as an existential crisis within the Canadian Armed Forces. Charlotte Duval-Antoine of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute says appointing a woman could bring new perspectives to the portfolio. But she cautions that tying a female defence minister's appointment to the current crisis could undermine her competence and see the blame put on her if the military fights culture change. Well, joining us now to discuss this further is Ms. Charlotte Duval-Antoine herself. She is the Ottawa Operations Manager and a fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Ma'am, welcome to Forum Daily. Thanks for having me today. So let's start with a quick overview of the military's record of handling cases of sexual misconduct and why experts are calling for a new defense minister in the first place. So we have seen for the past three decades uh, quite an inaptitude of really dealing with prevention and response to sexual misconduct issues. And we have seen since the spring of 2021, the Minister of National Defense uh, at the time, sorry, Harjit Sajjan, sorry, quite unable to, to really gain momentum and to really move forward on, on this issue, especially since the Deschamps report in 2015. And you say, along with other experts, that appointing a woman can provide new perspectives to this portfolio. So can you tell us a little bit more about these perspectives here? I, th I think that a woman could bring new perspectives because she has different lived experience. But I mean that in terms of like the general defense portfolio and not just the issue of sexual misconduct. I have a problem with just tying a woman to the issue of sexual misconduct because it gives the impression that only a woman can deal with that, that problem when it's actually not the case. What we need is a more forceful defense minister that is able to really direct the Canadian Armed Forces in their efforts to change the culture. So this seems like a very uh, tricky situation, ma'am. Uh, you previously indicated that tying the defense minister's appointment to sexual misconduct may actually undermine her competence. So uh, what do you mean by this? And how can we go around the situa situation here? So the issue is that what we call the glass cliff, which means that we appoint a woman in time of crisis. And then when she is not able to uh, change the culture or like address the crisis, we tend not to uh, appoint a woman in that position for a long time, even though it is not the fact that it is a woman uh, that could um, like per se, that could address the issue. It is more an institutional problem and a problem of civilian governance of the Canadian Armed Forces. So to go around this, we need to really have a government that asks itself questions about what it needs to do to better improve its relationship with the Canadian Armed Forces and what it requires for the Canadian Armed Forces to really change its culture long term. All right, ma'am. Well, coming off the heels of the federal election, how can our new government set up the next defense minister for success in managing this uh, very difficult portfolio, regardless of their gender? I think that we need to ask ourselves the question of whether our governance system of our defense portfolio is working today. We have an integrated uh, defense department, which is fine, but we have seen a defense ministers try trying to take more of a laissez-faire approach to some issues within the military, we need a defense minister that actually directs the Canadian Armed Forces in their effort and monitors them throughout the process. Having a stronger parliamentary committee would be helpful as well. And unfortunately, we have seen the failure of it um, in the past few months. So, so we really need to, to have more proactive members of parliament and more proactive uh, minister, like we have seen after the Somalia uh, Commission of Inquiry, what would you have Minister Doug Young being very proactive in uh, pursuing reforms within the Canadian Armed Forces. 
All right, ma'am, just about a minute left. But uh, in 1993, the first and only female defense minister in Canada was Miss Kim Campbell. Uh, but that was just about for six months. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about how she governed and uh, ha has anything changed since then? So Kim Campbell, like there is a lot of politics involved in the fact that she was defense minister for only, only three years, but she came at a time that was very difficult for the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, you had budget cuts, you had the Somalia affair that was, that was blowing up at the time, and you also had gender integration. And what we have seen is that as most other defense ministers at the time, she was quite laid back. She was leaving the chief of the defense staff, really leading what the Canadian Air Forces needed to be done within their own culture. And it is quite understandable since we consider the Canadian Air Forces as a profession that needs to regulate itself. All right, after the break, a look at the return of the two Michaels and what it may mean for Canada-China relations going forward. Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor have been released after over 1,000 days of captivity in China. Former ambassador to China Guy Saint-Jacques says the events leading up to the return of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor have severely tarnished China's reputation. He says the Chinese were so eager to get Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou back that they dropped all pretensions that the men had been arrested for good reasons. Meanwhile, concerns are rising among experts over China's use of hostage diplomacy. This is something that Mr. Guy Saint-Jacques has predicted for quite some time. The former ambassador to China joins us now on Forum Daily. Sir, welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Now, you have indicated that the events leading to the return of the two Michaels have tarnished China's reputation. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more on this? <clears throat> well, I would say that uh, since uh, Mrs. Meng was arrested and then the two Michaels, we have learned a, a lot more about uh, the dark side of China. And uh, for instance, we know about the uh, genocide going on in Xinjiang, uh, repression in Hong Kong, in Tibet, to what China is doing in the South China Sea, uh, and also how badly they manage the uh, pandemic at the outset. And uh, I think the, that Canada uh, had a very successful uh, strategy uh, uh, when it went to rally support from other countries. Uh, and as a result, a number of foreign leaders raised the case of the two micro uh, with the Chinese leaders, which uh, was a surprise for them. And then last February, Canada uh, uh, was uh, piloting the, this uh, declaration against arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state, uh, relation. So I think that uh, China probably feels that uh, ostrich diplomacy uh, work uh, this time, but also, if they are honest, they will realize that uh, their reputation was tarnished, that uh, other countries uh, uh, have taken notice. And I think now to prevent future occurrence of ostrich diplomacy, uh, Canada should uh, uh, develop criteria that uh, would be used to trigger common reactions by the countries that have signed this declaration, including sanctions. All right, sir. Now, on the other hand, we have the Chinese government saying that the release of Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor was for health reasons. So uh, what do you make of that statement and the timing of their release? <clears throat> well, you know, the, the, states, the statement that they issued yesterday, I could have written that uh, in advance because th this was uh, predictable. Uh, you know, they, they did the same thing when they released Kevin Garrett uh, back in September uh, 2016. And, and of course, in this case, what is surprising right, with the speed of the release is that I think we have to be grateful to uh, President Biden because he is the one who spoke with uh, Xi Jinping and told him that uh, the two Canadians had to release. And so China just dropped any pretension that uh, the two were subject to uh, a normal, a transparent a judicial process. All right, sir, just about two minutes left here. But uh, what sort of policies should our Canadian government take regarding China moving forward after all of this? Well, I think we, we should base our policy on uh, the base on the defense and protection of our values and interests. Uh, of course, we have to be a lot more selective in our engagement strategy. We have a, a, to adopt a, a much a stronger a, a stance. I hope that Canada will recover its voice to criticize uh, the, what... Uh, uh, what's going on in China in relation to uh, uh, human rights uh, abusers. Also, we need to work with partners to uh, fend off the bullying tactics of China, including when they use trade as a, as a weapon. 
Uh, and uh, if we are in good company, we may be able to force China to change its behavior. All right, sir, a minute and a half left. But talking about trade, we know China has applied to join the CPTPP free trade bloc. Uh, how should member countries, including Canada, respond <clears throat> to this? Well, on that, the overall message to China should be, you know, we have no problem uh, if China wants to play a, a bigger role on the uh, international scene, we recognize that it's a superpower, but it has to play by the rules. Uh, it has to respect it, its word, and it, it, it should be welcome to the CPTPP if uh, they promise to uh, deliver on the commitments they made, for instance, when they joined the WTO in 2001. And in fact, we should put very strict uh, conditions, including uh, that they allow for greater uh, competition by foreign firms, that they stop uh, subsidies to their state-owned enterprises. And I think they won't be able to meet these cri uh, criteria for uh, some time. All right, sir, just about 30 seconds left here, but there are still over 100 Canadians detained in China, including Robert Schellenberg, who's sentenced to die. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the futures of these individuals here? Well, I, I'm afraid that, you know, we have four people on uh, death row in China. I hope that the, the government can negotiate uh, in the case of Mr. Schellenberg and that they, they will revert his sentence to the, the previous one, which I think was uh, 14 years. Uh, for the others, we, we, there's a big problem because many of those are Canadians of uh, Chinese origin, uh, and uh, it will continue to be an irritant in the relationship. Germany is starting the task of building a new ruling coalition after a tight election on Sunday. However, observers say the process can be tricky. Parties in the Netherlands have been negotiating on and off for more than six months since an election in March, and still no coalition is in sight. Across the border in Belgium, Alexander de Cruz government was formed a year ago. This ended almost 500 days of talks, caretaker cabinets, and a minority coalition to see the country through the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And after four inconclusive elections in two years, Israel's current eight-party government is unlike anything seen before. A pair of American siblings have returned home from China. This comes after the country lifted an exit ban following Canada's release of a top Chinese tech executive wanted in the U.S. on fraud charges. The State Department said Cynthia and Victor Liu returned to the U.S. on Sunday after consular staff in Shanghai helped facilitate their departure. The department added in a statement that the U.S. would continue to advocate on behalf of all American citizens in China who are subject to arbitrary detention and coercive exit bans. Japan's government says the coronavirus state of emergency will end Thursday, so the economy can be reactivated as infections slow. Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga announced the virus restrictions will be eased gradually. With the lifting, Japan will be free of emergency requirements for the first time in more than six months. The current state of emergency, declared in April, was repeatedly extended and expanded. Despite public wariness and frustration over the measures, Japan has managed to avoid the more restrictive lockdowns imposed elsewhere. Guinea's military junta has released a transitional charter. It outlines the missions and duties of the transitional government. It also bars any members of the junta from running in elections that will eventually return the West African nation to civilian rule. Lieutenant Colonel Mamadi Dumboya, who led the September 5th coup, will serve as president in a transition that will remain in place until it determines an election date. Homicides in the U.S. in 2020 increased nearly 30 percent over the previous year. This is the largest one-year jump since the FBI began keeping records. That's according to figures released Monday by the agency. Homicides and non-negligent manslaughters climbed an estimated 29.4 percent to 21,570. This is an increase of 4,901 over 2019, according to FBI data. Other crimes, including property offenses, robbery and sexual assault, dropped in 2020. France and Greece have announced a major multi-billion euro defense deal, including Athens' decision to buy three French warships. French President Emmanuel Macron and Greek Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis announced the Defense and Security Strategic Partnership in a joint news conference in Paris. Greece will purchase three French frigates. They are to be built by Naval Group in western France, according to Mr. Macron. And Mr. Mitsotakis added that the deal includes an option for the acquisition of a fourth frigate. North Korea has accused the United States of hostility and demanded the Biden administration permanently end joint military exercises with South Korea. 
North Korean Ambassador Kim Song's comments came on the last day of the UN General Assembly's annual high-level meeting. It came shortly after the North fired another short-range missile into its eastern waters. Animal rights groups have welcomed the South Korean president's offer to look into the banning of consumption of dog meat. President Moon Jae-in had asked in a meeting if it was time to carefully consider the proposal. Eating dog meat is neither legal nor explicitly banned in South Korea. Restaurants serving it are dwindling as younger people find it less appetizing. But some people oppose a ban as a surrender to Western pressure. Global shoppers face possible shortages of smartphones and other goods ahead of Christmas. This comes after power cuts to meet government targets forced Chinese factories to shut down and left some households in the dark. The disruption to China's vast manufacturing industries reflects the ruling Communist Party's struggle to balance economic growth with efforts to rein in pollution and emissions of climate-changing gases. Ford and a partner company say they plan to build three major electric vehicle battery facilities and an auto assembly plant by 2025. This would be a big investment in the future of EV technology. The plants, to be built in Kentucky and Tennessee, will make batteries for the next generation of Ford and Lincoln electric vehicles that will be produced in North America. Well, life can be a bore sometimes, and that's okay. But what's not okay is that in Rome, bores are a big part of life. These days, residents of the Eternal City are struggling with an invasion of wild boars. The animals have rampaged through the city, running around in bunches through the streets in search of food. Animal experts say the trash is a factor, but so is a booming boar population. All right, that'll do it for your look at national and international news for today. Remember, for news on demand, you can always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, or follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm Nima Rajan, and this was Forum Daily News. We'll see you next time, Canada.